We're going to start off by thanking Kavar Jewelers for lending in the Seiko SLA055. And a big thank you to Studio29 for lending in the Rolex Submariner. No wait list. Go to their website and buy the Rolex of your dreams today. Today, we are going to do a battle. It's been a while. And we have two beautiful watches from two amazing watch houses. We got Seiko in the blue corner. And in the black corner, we have the Rolex Sub Mariner 124060. Both these watches are beautiful, but is one better? Let's find out. Oh, and another thing quickly. If you're new to the channel, I am a huge Seiko fan, but I don't care who wins this battle. I really don't. I don't care what you buy. I only care what I buy. Okay. And I'm not trying to influence you. This is just a battle. All right. And if any biases come through, let me know down below. And I'm going to try my best for that not to happen. So far, we've done, I think, four battles. Seiko has won every single one. But can the Rolex do it? It's only five times the price, but can it do it? We're going to find out. Category number one is the movement. The movement on the Seiko is hand finished by a Grand Seiko Master Watchmaker. We have the Spron 610 Hairspring, which is comprised of cobalt, molybdenum, chromium, nickel, and other. I don't know what other is, Seiko's being secretive. They've shown the Grand Seiko Hairspring in this movement stretched to four centimeters and it returns to its exact shape. Okay, so there is an advantage over silicone hair springs. Don't think because silicone is the new hotness, it's the best five years to develop the hairspring. And it does a lot of the heavy lifting on this beautiful, fully milled, hardened, rhodium plated Seiko movement. Now, they use MEMS technology on the escapement and on the pallet fork. So it looks very similar to Rolex's Chronergy escapement. Okay. Now, the Rolex. Chronergy escapement was invented by Seiko. <laughs> well, not really. The two gentlemen at Rolex who invented the Chronergy escapement with the help of computers, 3D modeling, those two Rolex watchmakers brought the SUA idea to life. They were citing a SUA watchmaker's patent from 1971. Who is SUA? Well, SUA is now Grand Seiko. The Grand Seiko patent. Seiko never utilized it. It never made it into the mainstream watches, but it basically said for the most efficient transaction of the escapement and the pallet, the escapement should be double the pallet. Okay. And usually the pallet is double the escape teeth. It's in the horological journal. I'm going to link to the SJX article down below. It's very interesting. So Rolex's new movement's claim to fame began as an idea or patent from a Seiko or Grand Seiko now watchmaker. Very interesting. It also has a trick hairspring made out of alloy. It is made from zirconium and niobium. Now, what does all that mean? And which movement is better? Let's check them out. Now, in the last battle, I made the Seiko movement lose, even though it performed better. It was the Willard versus the Rado, I believe. A lot of people were upset. So I don't care if you think the Rolex movement is better. We're going to do the performance. Whatever we see right here today, that's the better movement. All right. And look at these numbers. Fourth and final round, zero. Okay, we're going to do 12 down to see the positional variance, how it's going to react on your wrist. All right. So right away, we see an amplitude drop, but the beat error remaining the same. Very nice. So we got zero dial up. This movement is officially not regulated by Seiko. It is rated at plus 15 minus 10. They want you to buy a grand Seiko. Let's ignore the first number and the fourth and final round plus one. So zero and plus one. Let's do a third position. We're going to do crown down the third most popular position on your wrist. The first two, we already did it. Okay, so let's really see this movement. How does it react on the wrist? 
man, that Spron mainspring, I mean, sorry, hairspring is a beast. Look at this, keeping everything steady. Plus one, plus two, plus three. And the fourth and final round, plus three. Let's do a bonus round. Come on. Look at that, Spron. I bet if I left it for 30 minutes, it would go to zero. Unbelievable movement. Okay, so we're going to do the Rolex now. It is superlative chronometer. What does that mean? Rolex regulates it to plus two, minus two, seconds a day, 70 hours of power reserve. It is the 3230. And it has the same beat rate as the Seiko, four hertz, 288 VPH. You're going to get a nice, smooth sweep. And look at this. The amplitude is weaker than the Seiko, but we're getting a pretty good number. Negative one, zero, plus one, plus one. And the fourth and final round, two. Hmm. I ignored the first number. All right. Okay, we're going to do 12 down now to see the positional variance and typical of these new Rolex movements. The amplitude dropped significantly. I've seen it a lot with all the Rolex reviews. They have a low amplitude. Maybe, maybe Seiko was right to uh, <laughs> not continue the research on their grand Seiko patent from the 70s. <laughs> All right, but you can argue with zero seconds a day as the fourth and final round. Unbelievable. And no beat error. Okay, in this shootout, we are on the third round now crown down <laughs> i'm not used to saying that guys we we never do crown down here it just takes too much time but this is a battle it's not a review so we're going all out here amplitude is still really weak at 250 b air 0.1 0 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 let's go a fifth round final round is plus 2 okay hmm Picking a winner is tough. So the score for the movement, the Seiko did outperform it just a hair, and it's going to get eight and a half out of 10. We're going to double it to 17. And the Rolex is going to get an eight. So that's 16. Round two, the design. This is a little bit subjective. However, both are icons from the past remade. The Submariner has always been the Submariner. It never changes. But this version, I'm a fan of the old one. This one's a little bit chunky, a little bit side slabbed, uh, even though they did taper down those lugs a bit. And this one is the 6159 7001 remade, the iconic Marine Master case. So both designs are images of the past brought in modern times. So it's a toss up and it's a little bit subjective. So I'm going to say they're equal, both eight out of 10 for design. OK, no design is perfect, but I think they both look beautiful in their own right. So to be fair, both get eights. Round three, fit and finish, double the points. Movement, we doubled it. Design, we did not. Fit and finish, we're doubling it because it's so important. And this one is a little bit unfair because Grand Seiko actually builds this Seiko. And there's a lot less dust under this crystal than there is in this crystal. And the indices here are perfection. There's just perfect polishing and brushing and ridging on the 12 o'clock. Here you can see micro scratches on the white gold. It is white gold, so very nice. But the finishing is not the greatest. There's dust on the minute hand. There's dust on the hour hand. And of course, dust underneath the crystal. A lot of it. Guys, any dust you see in my videos, it's not on top of the crystal. Very rare. Maybe once you'll see a speck but uh, it's usually under the crystal. I'm going to try to show it in this video. I'm going to take a lens swab that I used to clean my cameras and it absorbs dust. And you can see it doesn't pick up the dust on the Rolex. There is a lot on the crystal top side on the inside. There is some on this watch, but it's a couple specks here and there. And it's usually much easier to see on a domed glass. This one is domed. All right. So definitely an advantage here. The fit and finish is spectacular. The brushing, even with the ever brilliant steel, is just Seiko showing off their mastery in watchmaking because this steel is so hard to work with. It's ever brilliant steel. It's used in the structural components of marine structures. It lives in the ocean. It's attacked by salt 
24 seven. How long does a bridge stand for? Can you imagine how long it's gonna last on the wrist, especially on a luxury diver that will never, <laughs> never see water? So yeah. Ah, it's just perfection. The case is perfection. Now this steel is also special, not as anti-corrosive as the Ever Brilliant, but it's 904L. It's gonna scratch a little bit more. However, this is Zeratsu polished, hand polished. This is not hand polished. This is machine polished. Of course, the Zeratsu polish is much superior. However, Zeratsu polish scratches easily and you're never gonna get it right again. You have to send it back to Japan. The Rolex has pretty good fit and finish, but tons of dust, a little bit of scratching on the gold, hour markers, hands, not very clean, crystal, not clean. Seven out of 10, 14 total when we double it because fit and finish is so important. How are we gonna mark performance? Well, there's a couple side categories, water resistance. This one prorated 200 meters, all right? Not bad. And let's check out the loom. Okay, this is half an hour time lapse. Okay, it is obvious the Seiko wins with the better loom, much better performance. If you have a diver, you want to be able to see the loom. Your life may depend on it. Crown action, absolutely perfect. But I think the Rolex is a little bit better with the clutch system. The bezel action, very nice here. Smooth and buttery. Nice dampened feel. This is also gonna be subjective. It depends on what you like. The Rolex, a little bit more clicky. 300 meters, so much better. It's not officially certified, but Rolex says they do better testing. I don't know if I believe them, but there we go. There, everything lines up. It's a beautiful high quality click and feel, very tactile. I think performance of the bezel is better on the Submariner, pretty good on the Seiko, and it depends on your tastes. You might prefer the Seiko better, you might prefer the Rolex better. Crown, I'm gonna say this one wins, water resistance, Submariner wins. The metal, these are divers, 904, very corrosion resistant, but not as corrosion resistant as ever brilliant, okay? So performance of the steel, Seiko wins. Well, Seiko wins two categories here, loom and corrosion. Very important for a diver. The Rolex wins bezel, crown action, and water resistance, which is also important for a diver. This is a tough one. Hmm. I'm gonna say eight and a half for the Seiko. And I'm gonna value the water resistance a little bit more, even though it's not ISO rated. For the performance, nine for the Rolex. Now the brand, we're gonna double the points as well. So we doubled movement, we doubled fit and finish, and now doubling brand. This is the last doubled category. Those three are the most important. Now the Rolex brand is basically the best brand in watchmaking. Many non-watch enthusiasts recognize Rolex and actually they buy the, they buy the Rolexes the most. In my small circle of friends, family, cousins, People I know in the business that own a Rolex, they're not really into watches, but they know Rolex and that's a good thing. That means everyone knows your watch. It has become a sign of pure success. When you wear a Rolex, you're showing society, hey, I made it, I'm important and humans, you know what, you get, we're all about ego. <laughs> if you wanna to talk to someone, a girl or anyone for a long time, talk about them. They'll talk for hours. It's always like that. So Rolex, definitely, definitely the best brand just because that's what people want. Now, I think personally, the watch enthusiast, I'm turned off by the brand. Like I would never wear a Rolex, never, never, never. I used to think I wanted one, but that was just the marketing. Just, I think the enthusiast is gonna lean towards Seiko. They got tons of history, just as much as Rolex, but they're completely in-house. The Rolex is not in-house actually. The hands are made by this company, okay? <laughs> Everything else, Rolex bought the people who make their watch, uh, their cases. They bought the people who make their bracelets. They bought the people who make their movements, but they didn't buy the people who make their hands. So I think as an enthusiast, the brand Seiko holds a little bit more salt. Of course, it doesn't have the brand appeal to non-watch enthusiasts. You meet someone at work, they see you have a Seiko, they think you're on food stamps. <laughs> So for brand, although Seiko is my favorite brand, I'm gonna say nine out of 10. We're gonna double it to 18. 
And the Rolex being a Rolex, that's an easy one. 10 out of 10, doubling it to 20. Now value, another easy one. When you buy a Rolex, realistically, the price doubles. You just doubled your money. You spend 10,000, you made 10,000. I know a guy who bought a Hulk, flipped it, and then went back on the wait list for another Hulk. So he basically got a free Hulk because eventually he got the call for that other Hulk. So when you buy a Rolex, you make money, which is unheard of. So value, 10 out of 10. So two 10s in a row for the Rolex, killing it. Now Seiko value. A lot of people think this watch is overpriced. It's not their fault. They don't know any better. They just know Rolex is the king, all right? But let's look at the SLA 017, the 62 mass, the first reissue, 2000 units made. None on the market right now as of filming this video. And when they do come up, they usually sell for more than what they were originally purchased for. So that's something to keep in mind. Of course, it's four or five years old now. This one has less units, 1300, I believe, if I remember correctly. And basically, it's going to do the same. Maybe in five, 10 years, you're going to get your money back at least. So with the limited ones, I wouldn't worry too much about it. The price drops a lot at the beginning because there's always desperate um, Japanese online sellers. They're going to give you big discounts, but that fades away. OK, you can always get a cheaper used one from someone maybe who abused it or someone who's desperate for money. So someone with a Rolex is not going to be desperate for money. You're not going to see that huge drop. But don't be fooled. The SLA 017 is a good example of what might happen to this. It might not, but I'm just guessing. So for value, we're going to do eight, two points under the Rolex. Now the Rolex, it doesn't have any X factor really. It's just everyone wants it. Is that an X factor? Everyone wants something? Fear of missing out? Hmm, I don't see that as special. When everyone wants something, I see it as fear of missing out, following the herd. Now the Seiko. X factor, I think a little bit higher because it has the ever brilliant steel. When someone sees this on the wrist, they're going to realize it's a little bit special and they might even ask you about it. It's definitely a conversation starter and it does get people's attention. It has a unique thing about it. Not that much X factor, but a little bit more than the subby. Let's go with seven. We're going to go with seven. <laughs> okay, guys, let's check out the grand total. I have no idea. I do these off the cuff with my gut feeling it always works out. And uh, now that I doubled the scores, I can't. There's no way I can figure this out. I'm going to have to do it while editing. <laughs> So I don't know who the winner is, but who is the winner for you guys? I'm sure 99% of you are going to say Submariner. Of course, um, it's a beautiful watch. It's well made. It has a tank of a movement with great history, but the same can be said about the Seiko. So both great watches. I love them both. If money was no object, I would have them both. You know, I hung out in the Rolex forums a little bit. And I'm surprised how many Rolex owners own SLAs. It's quite surprising. So which one is your pick? I'm going to put the scores down below while I'm editing. And did the better watch win? I'm going to say yes, it did. And <laughs> I don't even know who won. But from my gut feeling, my rationalizations, it took my bias away. Yeah, I think the better watch won. All right. If you like this video, please like, share and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one.